This is Tibetan Dog. It pulls a bit more weight than Kojima's prior movies. We start with an aerial shot with a 3D composition, where the perspective is changing. I don't know if it quite works, but it's still an ambitious way to look into it. And of course, because it's Kojima, we get the returning spinning perspective shot. There's a bit more going on in this film in general when it comes to this sort of stuff. It still has that high contrast scheme as you'd expect from his prior production, including the same character designer. This is the same team he worked with on Monster once again. It has a higher frame count in his last movie, and does feel a little bit more polished in areas. The film itself actually has a quite a specific colour palette as well with its green fields, its sky blue situations and the golden yellows of the dogs or garments that the characters wear. It makes it have a very particular feel. You're also going to see a lot more digital compositing or digital effects than you'd see in the prior movies from Kojima. These gradient shades with light sources from different places, if it be like the specific hour of time where they shot or different sort of lanterns, they try and take advantage of that. It's actually a Chinese co-production and they really wanted to show off the site of the culture. This is in itself a fish out of water story about a city boy joining the traditional Tibetan culture. You sort of get to understand something there while focusing on this father-son relationship. That's the beginning or something here to, about making amends with them. You have an estranged father. His mother recently passed away and it's him about reconnecting with them. His father seems to have a quite utilitarian detached lens of everything. He himself is a doctor, but he did leave his family to deal with the village. In a way, I suppose he saw the village's needs outweighed his family's. It still doesn't mean that there isn't this sort of cold emotional standstill with him, even if his son is admittedly quite upset about how he's handled things in the past. It covers these topics in a kind of mature angle, in such a way where you don't necessarily have to empathise with him. His father is neither good nor bad, he's just very, very set in his ways. But he still acts like a complete dick. You know, when I was chasing after a sheep today... Tomorrow I will be riding out to visit a distant village in the morning. You will stay here. Yeah, overall I think there's a lot of good character acting here, although I will say the horse animation could be better. Uh, this is a lost talent for sure, and it's really hard to get horse stuff just right. I mean, you've got to look at Vampire Hunter D, right? But here it's, it's a little bit off. And there's enough horses that it is somewhat noticeable, though I don't think it ruins any experience. In comparison to the character acting, it's worth mentioning that there's a lot of like animal animation in this film. That's something that's not particularly easy to get correct. So I think that they went the extra mile is uh, pretty good. Especially when you're talking about these herding scenes. These herding scenes, they remind me of stuff you'd see in Heidi. <laughs> Although I don't think there was as many wolves and bears. The black bear attack really highlights something at first to, towards me about the different perspectives in the film. This is where you get introduced to the Tibetan mastiffs, these sort of golden dogs. I assumed at first, honestly, that this was a bit of like hyperbole. Like there's no way a dog could take on a bear. Is that even possible? But apparently, you know, this is a real breed of dog and they're some of the biggest and heaviest in the world. They're very protective and they're used to basically protect livestock, especially at night with they're let loose just to do what they do. And they can take down some of the fiercest animals with fighting with wolves to leopards to further. So yeah, they may be worth like an afternoon of wikipedia or something. Now, the main boy, he seems to be singled out by some of the sort of stereotypical bully characters. It's kind of a repeated faction of the Madhouse pictures, though it doesn't really amount to anything because it's so quickly resolved that uh, you never see them again. The only thing you're basically saying is an offhand comment. Though I do really like the sort of position here with the boy and the dog narrative, as well as around the idea of trying to understand who his father was. I think these elements work really well as you sort of learn a bit more about the village and its characters. It's quite endearing, although there is a B-plot about a murderous creature on the loose that becomes more important as the story goes along, starting with some bits with the, uh, the dog fights. And the fights between them can become quite silly, especially at first, where these two dogs basically almost fall to their death after a bit of a ruckus. <laughs> And that's when you're going to start to see the contrast between things. On one side, you have probably the more human drama uh, element, which is mostly grounded, a little bit comedic at times, but it all makes sense. Then on the other side, you have the dog stuff, which can be otherworldly, let's say, especially when it comes to the more mysterious factors. The whole internal dog culture and can be very um, iffy. And the actual demon dog plot, I guess, a little bit limited. If you don't like medical stuff, this, this film can be a little harsh around the edges. There is some nasty stitching scenes, some pretty gory bits and pieces for a family film. It has some teeth. The child still resents me. Uh -huh. 
I understand. Long ago, I made a tough choice to let him and his mother leave. Mm -hmm. It is something I have had to learn to live with. Doctor? But his anger towards me will only make him stronger. Regardless of how I feel about the father character, some of the stuff he says is pretty messed up. Like, anger towards him only makes him stronger? Who is this guy, fucking Palpatine? But it does sort of lead you towards uh, the bond between the boy and the dog more so. Although, with these kind of stories, that never ends well. And yeah, and the major appeal is watching them sort of become, like, these two outsiders introducing themselves into the specific culture of Tibet. Which is, yeah, a rarity. You don't tend to see that sort of stuff covered. And this movie was based on books from Yang Zhi Jun, who is a Tibetan, and a lot of his ideas seem to be inspired by his own father, who spent some fair time living in the mountains, as well as himself. So he understands these certain concepts. Say, for example, just like the cultural stuff like butter tea. This one I thought was pretty unique. So it's yak butter, dark tea leaves, and usually two pinches of salt. The colder you live in uh, Tibet, the more salt you tend to get in these teas. The nomadic people drink it because uh, they're outside a lot and it keeps them warm effectively. They need those fatty acids, I guess. Outside of the nomad culture, there is the bandit stuff, which differ from the main tribe but are connected. And that was also a unique look in how they sort of coexist in these places, not affecting how the tribes work, but ending up trying to find passers by to make a living on a sort of traveling basis. But when the bloodbath sort of killer mystery gets involved, after it being introduced to both these sides of different um, factions, there begins a tension between them as they start accusing the main characters, Golden Dog, to be the actual killer. Although the ambiguity around this is actually resolved so fast that it probably wasn't worth necessarily bringing up. It does seem like it would have been better off if they'd spent more time trying to make it a little bit more ambiguous just because of how, how it is to be an outsider. But as it goes from here, the B-plot pretty much absorbs any of the, the family conflict error and it becomes more of a story about dog vengeance, which is pretty ridiculous, quite frankly. And as an audience, there isn't really a connection we can latch onto here because we've spent so much time trying to get connected to the family of the young boy and how that relates to stuff and his relationship with the dog that when you start hearing about the dog's prior relationships that you have no bearing on, it becomes a bit confusing to actually understand if this conflict is worth much of anything outside of to try and clear the dog's name. And this is where it falls into that sort of pure fantasy stuff where this demon creature who's way too big to be a dog, maybe it's some kind of hellish mountain lion, they get into this sort of David and Goliath battle. I can't do it. But you gotta! No, I need you to understand, son. This is Doji's fight alone. We can't interfere. Yeah, that's not really a great case for to uh, not stop them, man. I mean, that thing looks like it can murder a whole family if you're not careful. And it's fair to say that a lot of these spectacle elements are not bad in execution, but that's not what I would have preferred the story to go. It all seems a bit like a conceit to have a flashy finale, but only gets more absurd as it, it goes where they start out running avalanches. And oh my god, it's I think it ends as you'd kind of expect from a dog and boy storyline. Although not without merit, I suppose. The aspirations of the golden dog leave on generations of the, uh, the young man's family. There are certainly plenty of beautiful vistas on this setting, and I think you could do worse. Considering it is a Tibet story, those are unique, you don't see them much, uh, and it's a window into the culture of the an original story. But I do feel two ways about it. That is, it's pretty fascinating. And I would have loved to see this as like a TV show where they spent more time in like that Nippon fashion. Like you just spend a lot of time getting to learn these characters and their sort of internal turmoil. But when it gets to the more corny monster mystery stuff, I don't think it works very well. It's not that interesting. And I think it hampered the general experience of um, my enjoyment. It all felt a bit arbitrary towards the end. Like it just needed to happen this way to sort of get the saddest reaction. But it is a pretty well-made family animated project with a talented director, and the production is its definitely smooth. Albeit, I would say I'd recommend the director's prior work before this one. I hear from uh, certain sources that this was Murayama's last picture at Madhouse before he left, and it's definitely quite a different picture. I appreciate that it was made because of its unique setting and ideas. In fact, I would have liked to see more if possible, but that's just how it goes, I'm afraid. And it doesn't seem like the cross-production garnered much fruit because this is the last time they worked with their Chinese production house. But I guess that's just the way it goes sometimes. You can't win them all.
Also, I'm kind of bothered that the father-son relationship isn't patched up. It's just sort of this awkward situation. Like a lot of the ending is more like a cliff note where the main conceit about the boy finding his way to fitting it in or what he's going to do with his future, his relationship with his father. All of that is just sort of steamrolled over in a quick summary towards the end monologue. And then it's so far in the future that it doesn't even seem to um, matter anymore, which is a little jarring, quite frankly. It would have been nice to see a little bit more of that in the actual film, but I digress. I guess this is the end of the Muriyama Madhouse era. Look forward to the slow decline of Madhouse from now on, I guess. But maybe not in the movies we're going to cover, because there's only two left, and I know at least one of them is good. So tune in next time, where you can like, you can subscribe, you can comment, you can ring the bell if you want to see the, the next couple of episodes. And then we've got to thank those, we've got to thank those patrons. We've got, we've got Daniel Strait, we've got Alex Morati, and Joven. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Let me get out, cat. Come on. Come on. You know. Come on. Come on.